Well, welcome to this uh, Bond Solo on Expert Witness video. video. A great pleasure in introducing uh, Mike from uh, Waitmans. Mike Grant is a very experienced uh, litigator. Do you want to just tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, yes, I've been qualified for Anglerly for 25 years. I spend most of my time defending claims against architects, engineers and surveyors. So you use a lot of expert witnesses, presumably? Uh, yes, yes, and certainly have done over the years. Yeah. And you were, I think, on the winning side of the Igloo P piece case we were we were indeed yes what, what were the main lessons for experts from that case um, I think there were a number of generic uh, lessons to be learned really I, I think that uh, it emphasized the fact that as an expert you need to be objective um, you need not to be partisan or partial um, you need not to be an advocate for your client but always remember that you owe a duty and an obligation to the court um, I think it also um, highlighted the need to be open. So if you've got bad news for your client and those instructing you, the, the sooner you tell them, the better. Um, and I, I think it also emphasised the need for independence. So if you've got any uh, links or there's an existing relationship between you and those instructing, sorry, the, the, those instructing you uh, in the case, uh, you need to uh, identify that and identify whether or not you're able to proceed. Uh, and I think one of the main lessons to be learned really um, is about staying within what you know, to, to give evidence about subjects that you have a real and genuine expertise in uh, and not to venture out of that area. Well, these are all very basic principles in the civil procedure rules. It's astonishing that the experts didn't know this or at least followed them. What actually happened in the case? Uh, well, the case arose out of a professional negligence action uh, mm -hmm. against a firm of uh, engineers and surveyors in relation to a pre-purchase survey that was undertaken to Marshall's Mill just outside Leeds, uh, which was a, a very substantial old mill building built in the 1800s. Um, a survey was, was carried out by the building surveyor of, of PWP, uh, and he identified some cracking to, to three of those peers. Now, he made various uh, recommendations. One of those recommendations uh, was that one of his colleagues, a structural engineer, uh, ought to look at the cracking uh, and see if he could find out the cause of it. Um, the structural engineer looked at the cracking um, and he couldn't identify a cause, but recommended that it be monitored for a period of about 15 months uh, and said that a fund of about £20,000 ought to be set aside um, in order to cover the cost of potential strengthening works. Um, the sale proceeded at approximately just over £16 million pounds, um, of the mill um, and a number of years later uh, the cracking had deteriorated considerably mm. and some emergency work needed to be undertaken uh, in order to prop the premises. Um, and at that point a claim was formulated against uh, PWP uh, really upon the basis that a preliminary loading calculation ought to have been carried out um, initially, uh, that would have shown that there was ex excessive strain on the building and that would have shown that it was suffering from compression failure. Uh, that was the case against PWP. Uh, however, that, that claim actually failed and it was found that PWP had done all that could be expected of a reasonably competent engineering survey firm. I see. And you represented PWP. We did indeed. Yes. And so I can see from that that there may be several types of experts involved. Who was involved? What were they asked to do? Um, the, the claimants uh, Igloo had three experts. They had an engineer, a quantity surveyor and also a valuer. Uh, PWP had an engineer and a quantity surveyor. Um, and, and really at the trial the, the crux of the issue uh, between the parties was when a reasonably competent um, surveying engineer is confronted by cracking of the nature that was discovered in this in this building or they to carry out calculations in order to determine the cause. Um, so that was really the, the focal point of, of the expert evidence at the, of the trial uh, and the quantity surveyors and the valuers were, were giving evidence about quantum but on liability it was the engineers who, who gave the main evidence. And did they stick with the same experts throughout? The same um, experts? Igloo um, had instructed uh, uh, the expert who had originally formulated the remediation scheme to the premises. Um, so the firm of engineers who had identified the problem and formulated the scheme to deal with that, they, they stuck with that engineer as their expert for a period of time 
Uh, but then subsequently, certainly before the matter went to trial, that engineer was, was replaced um, by others. Now, it's very common in these sort of cases for experts to meet. Presumably there were meetings. What happened at the meetings? What was the effect of those meetings? Uh, yes, there, there, were, there were two meetings. Um, uh, the, the first meeting uh, was very straightforward, uh, went pretty well. Um, the experts met and discussed the, the relevant issues um, and a joint statement was, was prepared after that. Um, and that was all done in a relatively short space of time. Uh, and there was a great deal of cooperation between both of the experts. Um, in that joint statement, the claimant's expert made a number of concessions. Mm. Uh, and this was commented on by, by the judge in the trial. Um, now, when the time came to produce a second uh, joint statement, um, the prevailing circumstances had, had changed somewhat. Uh, and there was a dispute uh, between both the solicitors and indeed the experts um, about the format uh, that the report ought to be in uh, and also the, the terms of reference of that report. Uh, and it took far longer to produce uh, and it was also a fairly lengthy document which the, the judge commented on and wasn't very keen on uh, certainly when he saw was that this the because trial. The report didn't follow the guidelines in the civil procedure rules and the protocol or practice direction. Uh, well, it it, it it followed it did follow the guidelines, and the report was prepared in accordance with uh, with an order for the court. Sure. Um, but at that time, um, the relations between the experts had uh, deteriorated slightly, and again, this is uh, something that the the judge seized upon and. And mentioned during the course of the trial. So the report took longer uh, and was longer in length than certainly would have been ideal or helpful, the judge. the judge found. Now, you mentioned in your opening remarks about independence and duties of the court and understanding that those duties. Did the judge say anything to the experts about that? Yeah, I mean, the, the judge um, uh, had fairly detailed comments um, to make upon the, upon the expert evidence. Um, and he'd found that the claimant's engineering expert had been over-enthusiastic in his client's cause, uh, was his phrase. Um, and uh, he made specific comment about that uh, in his judgment and also made comment about the fact um, that the engineering expert on behalf of the claimant uh, also had to uh, row back in respect of a number of issues um, in his second report as compared to what was said in, in the first report. And you also mentioned, I think, about going outside their field of expertise. Was there any comment on that? Mm. Um, I think that the, the claimant's engineer uh, was relatively new to the uh, expert forum um, and his sphere of expertise um, wasn't particularly in relation to uh, the kind of work that was being undertaken that, that was the subject matter of this claim, uh, a sort of pre-purchase uh, type survey work. So although he was a very experienced and competent engineer, um, his particular niche and expertise wasn't perhaps focused uh, on the area that was the subject matter of the claim. And did the experts suggest all the points that the judge wanted to address, all the issues? Um, well, I think that they, they did address uh, all of the issues that, uh, that were relevant. Um, but the judge certainly uh, had some comments to make about the, the rather too lengthy nature of the uh, second joint expert report. Um, he also had some comments to make in relation to the evidence of the quantity surveyors. Um, he said he found a certain lack of transparency in relation to the approach adopted by the claimant's expert, uh, particularly in understanding the necessity to explain uh, how figures had been calculated. Um, so the judge again made specific comment about that. Um, and conversely, in relation to the defendant's expert, he commented on, on, on the straight, open nature uh, of the evidence given by the defendant's uh, quantity surveyor and how he dealt with things in a very old-fashioned, hands-on kind of fashion. Your expert. Indeed, yes. So it was a combination of your side, your expert being quite transparent and the other side not being transparent or perhaps being long-winded or... 
Yeah, I, I think the judge, uh, the judge commented and, and seized upon the issue about lack of transparency. Um, I think insofar as he found some of the calculations carried out by the claimant's uh, quantity surveyor rather difficult to follow um, and couldn't see necessarily that an explanation had been pr provided about how certain figures had been reached. So a lot of lessons for experts. What do you think was the main lesson? Is it independence or...? Yeah, I think, I think it's independence, it's objectivity, uh, it's remembering that an expert, as an expert, when you're involved in litigation, you owe a duty to the court. Um, you, you can't be partial uh, and you can't be an advocate for the party that you're representing. You always owe a duty to the court um, and always remain within the sphere of your expertise. Always be open and frank. If there's an issue with the case, uh, identify that and flag that up to those instructing you very early on in order that they're aware of the position and they can review the evidence in the light of, of your comments. And finally, the most interesting subject, costs. Uh, well, indeed. Um, rather unusually in this case, uh, the judge made an order for partial indemnity costs. Um, now, there are, there are a number of other... Can you um, just explain what that means for our experts? Um, well, the, 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 the order didn't only apply to the um, experts' costs, but all costs incurred from a certain point in the proceedings. Uh, and the point that the judge had identified at which indemnity costs would be payable uh, was a point at which uh, the trial was due to run in Chester originally, but due to lack of court time, uh, the matter was adjourned. Uh, the judge who was due to hear the trial had made various comments uh, about what he perceived to be weaknesses with the claimant's evidence. Um, and in light of those comments, the trial judge, Judge Aikenhead, concluded that he would be prepared to make an order in favour of the defendant, PWP, for indemnity costs from that date. Um, so uh, those costs ran from about six months before the actual trial that, that took place in, so, in so June expensive. this year. Uh, yes, yes, indeed, an expensive exercise. Mike, thank you so much. My great pleasure to hear from you. Um, you. The full judgment will be on the website and also linked to an article that Mike and his colleague have written will also be on the website. So thank you very much for watching.